I'd like to move on to one last drug before we conclude. And, you know, I think, you know, Dr. Shafsky did a wonderful job this year presenting uh, our phase three data and another drug called arubulin. And so, Jonathan, do you want to talk a little bit not only about what arubulin is, but actually this trial? Yeah, arubulin is a dynamic microtubule inhibitor. So it's, you know, its mechanism of action is similar to other agents that we use in the sarcoma world in terms of inhibiting uh, microtubules. It, in, um, showed some promising activity in sarcoma in the original phase one trial. This was followed up by phase two, and in this phase three trial, the 452 patients were randomized equally to either aribulin, day one, day eight, or decarbazine, which is a common comparator arm that you're seeing in our trials. And the, in this study, the aribulin arm provided a superior overall survival of 13.5 months versus 11.5 with with decarbazine, so again, a superior overall survival. Interestingly, there was no progression-free survival benefit either in this study. And so, so it does show promise in terms of overall survival, which was, the in this study, the primary endpoint. And so, so this phase three study certainly should be considered for um, approval by the agencies, I would think, for at least discussed for, for metastatic soft tissue sarcomas back to the issue of overall survival benefit in terms of a lack of progression-free survival um, could have to do with a number of different things. The biology of these drugs may be acting, acting different, differently in terms of post-progression efficacy, or there could be crossover in, in this study as well as the other, other studies. So I, I think it's interesting that the NCCN panel has already actually included this on the guidelines. So, you know, Andy, where do you see this actually fitting into where you were treating patients? Well, I mean, I think, you know, we're, this, this is an unusual situation for sarcomas when we're on the, the verge of potentially having many drugs to choose from without defined positioning in terms of clinical trial design to say for second, third, fourth, fifth line treatment. Um, again, the study was, was restricted to uh, Lymosarcomas and liposarcomas, and I would still look at those subgroups as potential treatment options. Uh, and coming back to the comments we've made before, which is um, let's look at our patients, let's look at what um, toxicity profile um, uh, is most um, important for that patient in terms of choosing the drugs. Um, and we could have these options of the same different drugs. It could be adromycin ifosamid, it could be adromycin laratumab, it could be adromycin. Um, or sorry, it could be trabectidin, it could be uh, ribulin. Um, it's going to be uh, a dealer's choice, I think, for a lot of these things, looking at, again, the features of the patient. Um, you know, what's the patient's performance status like? What's their need for cytoreductive therapy and shrinkage of the tumor? Um, what's their need for um, other tolerance for different toxicities? You know, I, I think that's well put. You know, there was a brief abstract presented this year on regorafenib. Do you have any thoughts on that, Shreyas? So I, I think a simple short comment would be that this is, from a kinase inhibition spectrum standpoint, relatively or close enough to pazopanib. Uh, and the activity that they saw in the three cohorts that they tested was fairly comparable to what they saw in pazopanib. There is an ongoing SARC trial looking at regorafenib in a few different subsets. Uh, so I think it's in keeping with what would be expected, given how much you can extrapolate from their kinase inhibition, uh, kinase inhibition spectrum. You, you know, I, I, I think this is exciting. It only says we need more clinical trials. I mean, I think that's the one thing I'm hoping we can all agree on. But one final question, you know, Robin, with this, and if you throw in a drug we haven't talked about, which is a reformulation of albumin-bound adriamycin called doxorubicin, we really have this huge flux in our frontline therapy. What do you think the future of combination therapy, if you were to actually be able to go five years in the future and look back, where do you think we're going to go? So I, in response, I think there's uh, definitely uh, a future for combination therapy. I think the optimal um, schedule and sequence, um, as you allude, really remains to be def 
defined by ongoing clinical trials and future clinical trials. And I, I think this is a, an evolving uh, field, a rapidly evolving field, and um, I'm not going to give a definitive uh, answer in terms <laughs> of an optimal um, um, schedule. But I think in terms of combination therapy, yes, for sure, there's, there's, there's a future. And it's good to have a choice of, um, of different drugs um, that are showing promise in, in these rare diseases. So Dr. Randall, you know, one of the privileges of sitting around the multidisciplinary tumor board not giving chemo is you get to watch. And what are your feelings about when we should transition patients from active to true conservative palliative hospice type treatments? Uh, it's an issue that's near and dear to my heart. Um, we all know that as oncologists, whether we be medical, pediatric, radiation, or surgical, our mission is to prolong life, but as we've all resonated again today, maintaining quality of life is very important. And it becomes a personal decision you make with, not for, a patient and their family. And that trigger point is different for everyone. And that's why the communication is so important and gets back to our opening comments about the social workers, survivorship issues, some people, you know, people unfortunately have a lot of pressure also to keep fighting because they feel their family will be disappointed in them if they don't keep fighting, but they're actually exhausted. And it's a hard discussion uh, when to say enough is enough and let's emphasize on today and your quality of life today and not worry about the future so much, but let's make you happy now so you can enjoy the time you have. And that's a hard thing. I don't think any of us has a pet answer for that, but it's something that we all need to carry with us every single day with our, with our families. I think that's well said. And I, I think that it's one of the complex, this makes the treatment of sarcoma, now that we have so many more drugs, even more complicated.